And I understand the sentiment patients with insulin resistance in the metabolic syndrome have a very high risk for cardiovascular disease. I understand the desire to try and lower LDL protein if you're going to eat meat from the leanest sources possible. And then at the bottom, they are showing how to count the carbohydrate content of a pizza so that you can count the carbohydrates and you can dose your insulin properly. But my question is, why are you eating pizza to begin with? If you have disturbed metabolism, if you have issues with carbohydrate intolerance, if you have this picture of metabolic dysfunction, why is pizza a regular food for you? You, you should be eating unprocessed food. You need to really provide an individualized approach and gauge what their, their willingness is. Okay, welcome. I'm very excited. We have uh, with us Dr. Lior uh, Needleman, who is from who, who's doing endocrinology over at Stanford University out there in Palo Alto. Dr. Needleman, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to to get to meet you. I'm a big fan, and this is just such a such an exciting opportunity for me. So, thank you. Let me ask you, endocrinology. Why endocrinology? First of all, why? What, you, what made you pick endocrinology? Yeah, I was always planning to do infectious diseases, actually. And then I was about halfway through internal medicine residency. And actually, it was I just learned about the carnivore diet. And I became obsessed with understanding human biology, human metabolism, a little bit more so than studying infectious diseases and pathogens. And so I switched the trajectory during internal medicine residency and just decided I wanted to, to focus in on endocrinology. Yeah, interesting. I, I ended up going to orthopedics, but you, one of my favorite subjects was physiology. And obviously, there's a lot of endocrinology in there and just how the different feedback loops work and everything. And it's, it, I enjoyed that. It was one of my favorite parts of medical school is actually the physiology, although I ended up going into surgery. Endocrinology, most people associate endocrinology with like diabetes, type 1 diabetes, but it's much more than that. Maybe you can talk about some of the things that maybe obviously the thyroid gland, but what do you, what does endocrinology encompass for people that aren't familiar? Yeah, endocrinology is really the science of hormone biology in humans, which is extensive. Diabetes is a is one of the diseases that we treat, largely because the action of insulin is important there, and there's many patients type one diabetes where we need to replace insulin. But a lot of what we do is replacing other hormones or at, at least providing an investigation in, in terms of what is the hormonal derangement for a lot of different diseases. So we treat disorders of bone and bone and mineral metabolism. We, tr we help patients who have problems with the pituitary gland, which is responsible for producing a lot of hormones that regulate a lot of different processes in the body. The thyroid, the adrenal glands, I really have a, an interest in adrenal physiology and pathology. And, and so there's really a lot of areas in terms of human health that, that endocrinology sees. And it's really much more than just diabetes. And uh, Yeah, one of the things, I, this concept, we know that I, I think most people are familiar with the fact that we have insulin and we have insulin resistance. And insulin resistance occurs based on the receptor. But every single hormone has a receptor, whether it's at the cellular level or in the nuclear level. Do we not see resistance to, to, to many hormones? Is there thyroid resistance, androgen resistance? Can we be affected by those things? And it's not where the, uh, the hormone insulin can be sky high, and yet we get very little effect due to the resistance. Can we see the same thing with other hormones? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. There can be. There can be cases, there, there can be instances in which there's hormone resistance and, and hormone deficiency. And I think that's what's so interesting is that a lot of what we do is just interpreting biochemical testing to really understand the nature of the physiologic derangement. And absolutely, you can definitely see it in things other than just in insulin signaling. Yeah, we don't really talk about the other ones as much. I don't hear much about that, but I'm, I, it has to exist clearly. And Yeah, it definitely does. You can see it with parathyroid hormone as an example. You can have resistance to parathyroid hormone. You can have deficiency for parathyroid hormone. You can have, it, it, usually, result, it usually results from mutations in the, at the receptor level. I've seen cases, these are much more rare. Insulin is, diabetes is much more common, but I've seen cases of resistance to aldosterone 
so you can see sky high aldosterone levels, or there can be cases where there's hypoaldosteronism. It definitely can be a hormonal deficiency and we need to replace it, or there can be end organ problems or receptor level defects at the level of the receptor. And I think that's just what's so fun about endocrinology is we're interpreting biochemical testing and really understanding it requires an understanding of human physiology. And I well, think let's go great. back insulin resistance. I think there's a lot of thoughts on the causation and what do you do about it? Obviously, it's one thing just to add more hormone. And this is often done in type 2 diabetes. We're just, you know, they can't get their glucose down. So we just keep slamming in insulin and with increasingly higher and higher doses to the point where people are on often hundreds of units of insulin a day, which is well about what would no normally be physiologically appropriate for that individual, typically, if they didn't have the insulin resistance. How do we, do we have any good strategies to repair resistance to whether it be thyroid resistance or insulin resistance? Or is there much thought about that within the realm of endocrinology? I'm sure somebody wants to develop a drug, which would be obviously making a lot of money, but obviously I'm a fan of nutrition and lifestyle. But what, what about on that side of the coin? Do we have any way to treat resistance? Yeah, absolutely. I think part of our visits with patients who have insulin resistance should be counseling, discussing strategies to reverse insulin resistance, which can be done. We know that lifestyle changes are very potent for re reversing insulin resistance, specifically weight loss and, and exercise. That combination we know from, from studies is very, very potent way to reverse um, insulin resistance, there are pharmacologic approaches. And unfortunately, I think patients have, I, I think it's hard for a lot of people to, to really make the most out of the lifestyle approach because it's hard to lose weight. It's hard to motivate yourself to exercise a lot. It can be challenging. And a lot of the times we are in the position, of course, of having to use medications but yeah, absolutely. Lifestyle, lifestyle approaches are really, really important to focus on. What is this, the state of the art thought on, say, diabetes at this point, as far as I hear a lot of people being told that they often the type ones, because that's often they end up going to endocrinologist, is that they're told just to eat whatever they want to eat and just dose insulin to count their carbs. And do you have, is that still the, the standard of care approach or is there some more sort of a nuance behind that at this point? I don't, I, 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 I definitely understand that. I think that a lot of the times you don't want to like really tell patients what they can and cannot eat. And a lot of the times we do adapt the pharmacologic approach to work with what they're eating. But absolutely, I think it's really important that we do provide counseling and we do give n nutritional sort of guidance. We work with our dietitians, and they, they are just instrumental, actually. And I think something that's helpful these days is that we are using uh, CGM very, very commonly, which is awesome. When patients can see, I, I, I think it is very powerful because it provides for patients, they're, they're able to see how they respond to different foods. And I think that's fantastic. So we are using CGM a lot and I don't agree completely with every single, with all of the advice that patients get regarding what they should be doing with their diets. And I think that actually is challenging because if you go on the, and I have an immense amount of respect for the American Diabetes Association. I participate in those their conferences and it's really an amazing organization, but I don't agree 100% with everything that you can find in terms of the dietary guidelines. For example, if you go on the, their website, there's very much still the approach of have consuming as little saturated fat as possible. And I understand the sentiment patients with insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome have a very high risk for cardiovascular disease. I understand the desire to try and lower LDL as much as possible, but I think that a lot of people get the wrong impression because their dietary guidelines, or really it's like a, a page on the website where people can learn about nutrition and dietary choices, and it really emphasizes to eat as little saturated fat as possible to get protein if you're going to eat meat from the leanest sources possible. And then at the bottom, if you scroll down, they are showing how to count the 
carbohydrate content of a pizza so that you can count the carbohydrates and you can dose your insulin properly. But to me, it sends the wrong message that we should avoid saturated fat at all costs and we should avoid red meat. We should avoid these things that to me are very, some of the most evolutionarily consistent foods that exist, but it's normalizing eating highly processed things like pizza. And so I think, and and the reason I feel this way is because I've seen at this point, many, many similar presentations of type two diabetes. Patient comes to the clinic and they're, you know, 30 years old and they have hyperglycemia in the 400s. And that's very concerning because somebody that young with that degree of hyperglycemia, you're immediately thinking that we need to exclude type 1 diabetes. And we'll do that. I very commonly am checking a C-peptide. Their C-peptide is robust. We check the GAD antibodies, marker for type 1 diabetes, they're negative. And they're And so we've excluded an insulin deficiency type 1 diabetes. And then there are these subtle signs in these patients of insulin resistance, maybe a little bit of increased waist circumference, the blood pressure is borderline, their triglycerides are quite high, the HDL is very low, and they have this severe hyperglycemia. And so it's just like, where? how is it possible that so many people that are so young are developing such severe insulin resistance? And when I ask them about what they're eating, they say, I've excluded, I stopped eating red meat years ago. And they think that they have protected themselves from, from any form of metabolic dysfunction. And, and that's quite the opposite of what's happened. They've excluded high protein foods. They've excluded red meat. And then, and when you ask them what they are eating, it's a lot of processed food, a lot of processed food. And I think that a lot of this common presentation that we're seeing is because of the the recommendations that we've given to people that as sort of normalizing processed food and making it seem like red meat is going to give you everyone a heart attack. And I think we need to be careful with that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I see the USDA pushing these Nova 4, which are the, the ultra processed foods as being healthy or could be healthy, depending on how you formulate it and what nutrients are in there. But at the end of the day, I think it is something that people overeat for sure. It's very easy to overconsume it. And then I think it just cascades from there. What do you find with C- with the invention of the, of the CGM and the wild, wide availability of it? Are you seeing better overall resi- results or is it still dependent upon, I guess, obviously the CGM is going to the diet may be affected by what they do with the CGMs, but have CGMs been fairly game-changing with regard to the, not what we know, but is it actually improving outcomes from what you can tell? Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I, I also just wanted to mention that the things that I mentioned in my ideas and everything, th- these are all totally my own opinion. And I really don't want people to think that anything I'm saying is really reflecting Stanford or Stanford endocrinology is really my own opinion and experiences. But yeah, absolutely. The CGM is amazing. I have patients who have really poor control of their diabetes and we start CGM, their time and range is absolutely extremely low. And then after they start to wear it for a while, that their time and range just dramatically increases. And yeah, I think it's absolutely very effective. And I talk to people and and they tell me that it is influencing their dietary choices. They found out this food really spikes their blood sugar. Other foods, they, they handle just fine. And there is variability in specific foods in terms of how it affects different people. So I think it's an incredible tool. And I also think we should be careful. I think it's really helpful for people who have a glucose intolerance and diabetes. It there, there are also people who really don't have any features of metabolic syndrome or glucose intolerance who use it. And it can be helpful for people in that picture too, but specifically people who have disorders of carbohydrate metabolism is, is very amazing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the ADA's goal for a type 2 diabetic and perhaps type 1 as well, hemoglobin A1C between 6 and 7 or something along those lines. Is, mean, that, is that problematic to have it still be abnormal, you think? Yeah, so it, it varies. The For each 
person, we need an individualized approach. If you are very elderly, the risk of hypoglycemia is very high. You might even accept a higher A1C than that because the reality is, is that you don't want to develop, you don't want patients to have hypoglycemia. So you need to consider the medications that they're taking. But for somebody who's very young and doesn't have a lot of comorbidities, I think it's fair to push the A1C much lower, even you know, lower than seven. I think that cutoff is really trying to, it incorporates the level of hyperglycemia at which we do expect that somebody might develop microvascular complications and complications of diabetes. But I, I think what you're trying, I think what you're saying is that there is room to go even lower with A1C. And I think that the, the metabolic syndrome is something that starts earlier. I think insulin resistance can be there are signs of insulin resistance that are present before your A1C is at seven. So I think that it, for some patients, it just depends on who you're working with. But yeah, I think that it is appropriate to go lower than that. And there's some patients where looking at a target of seven is appropriate. Yeah, I, I guess if you've got somebody who's chronically running 13 and you get them down to seven, you're going to be happy with that. And I guess one of the things with chronic hypoglycemias. Uh, episodes is a risk of dementia later in life. We know that there's a pretty strong relationship with that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Richard Bernstein, who is he's yeah. an 87 year old guy, that, or I think he's 89. Actually, I interviewed him a while back. Diabetic for 60 some years, one of the first guys ever to have access to to home uh, glucose measurements. But what he maintains is a lot of these hypos often are a result of basically overdoses of insulin when trying to correct hyperglycemias by eating a, a fairly carb-dominant diet. And so we're seeing this sort of wild vacillations in the, the glucose curve. So let me ask you, low-carbohydrate diets are recognized by the ADA now as a potential treatment option. Oh, on page six or something, it's not front and center. They hide that in there. They don't really advertise it much. But are you able to recommend that? I know you said you're a fan of the carnivore diet, which I've seen tremendous results, both with type ones and type twos. I guess one, how did you get interested in a carnivore diet? And two, is there room within what you're doing right now to, to incorporate low carb diets with your patients? Yeah. So I, I got interested in the diet because I think I was really, I just heard about it. And then I was the kind of, I just got obsessed with it and just went right wide in, like really just eating meat and water and salt. And I felt, I just felt amazing with it. And at the time I was doing a lot of running and I, I like running and lifting weights. And so I was running a lot at the time. And before I started to do the carnivore diet, I was having these episodes. Where I was maybe doing 50, 60 miles a week. And then around mile three or four, this is before I was eating carnivore and I was eating healthy, pretty clean food, but a lot of car, my energy was coming from carbohydrates and so three or four miles in, I would just develop, I would just get so tired. I would have these, I'd feel like it was hypoglycemia. I never checked my blood sugar, but I was, I would just feel so exhausted and humps, suddenly starving and just shaky. And then I'd have to get home and eat something quick, like a quick carbohydrate. And then I, I started the, the carnivore diet and everything was just, changed after that i was able to i just go on long runs and just never have these attacks again and i i could even i realized that i could even eat one meal of meat and or or even fast an entire day and then go and run a half marathon or i can eat two pounds of meat and go and run a half marathon so to me, it was just amazing that I felt great all the time. And I think it just provided this level of metabolic flexibility that you really can't get unless you're eating this kind of food. And so that was just when I realized this is a species appropriate diet and this is human nutrition to just never really feel that full and never really feel that hungry. You just feel good and stable energy levels all the time. And so I think that's really why I became convinced that, that, that the carnivore diet was so powerful. Personally, I, because I'm like a trainee and everything at Stanford, I, I don't really, I try to just provide to patients the most guideline based recommendations. Some people are receptive to talking about dietary approaches, being mindful of carbohydrates and, and those types of things, but I don't, I never 
really bring that stuff too much into the clinic at this point. I think in, in the future, I would love to do that. But right now, I really try to just follow guideline based approaches. I think it's challenging because I have a lot of reservation in terms of telling patients that it's okay to eat red meat because I believe deep in my heart that it's safe and that people would benefit from making that transition. And I I think it's very obvious when you look at CGM data and eating meat, (laughs) people do great on it. But I personally, I think the major, there's a huge barrier in terms of having people in the medical community be okay with red meat. I hear talks all the time where people actually citing studies where there's concern for red meat increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes, but there's they really don't provide any mechanistic insight about how that could be. And I, I, I think that's flawed. I don't think that red meat increases type 2 diabetes. I think there, there perhaps there's some observational epidemiology out there that might suggest so. I don't think that there's mechanistic data behind it, and I don't think it makes sense evolutionarily. So um, I, I don't believe in that. But I think the major task is how do we share with our colleagues in medicine that it might be okay to consume red meat and dietary saturated fat if it is if we know that it can slightly increase the LDL and i what i think is so important that really is not discussed is that the term LDL represents a spectrum of lipoprotein particles of varying size And I think that's very important to be aware of. Stanford Endocrinology has an extremely rich history in endocrine research. And we had one of the chairs was named Gerald Reven. And he's actually really the one who's attributed with describing metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. In 1993, he published a paper in JCI, which really showed that insulin resistant individuals have small and dense LDL. And these are small cholesterol depleted particles that really do exhibit concerning properties. They have reduced clearance by the LDL receptor. They, because of that, have increased residence in the circulation and greater exposure to the endothelium. And we know they have enhanced oxidative susceptibility. These are not my opinion. This is well established. And in 1996 in JAMA, there was data from the Stanford Five City Project that showed that LDL size is significantly smaller in patients who have coronary artery disease. And I I think it's actually really important that, I think it's interesting that patients with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, they're both at risk for cardiovascular disease, of course, but the mechanism is different. In patients with type 1, it's more of like an advanced glycation end product kind of picture. But with type 2 diabetes, I really believe that it's it's a greater amount of these small and dense LDL particles. And we know that people who have insulin resistance, in, 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 in people who have insulin resistance, the LDL-C probably underrepresents the cardiovascular risk because of this discordance between LDL-C and the LDL particle concentration. That's established. But what I theorize, what I think is very possible, and I wish we could show is that I think that in the absence of insulin resistance or other major traditional cardiovascular risk factors, I think that the cardiovascular risk from dietary saturated fat might actually be overrepresented with the LDLC. And I have an incredible example of this. I saw a patient, if you don't mind me sharing, because it was just so exciting. It was just very, I just enjoyed the, the, uh, the encounter. I saw a guy who had, he was probably, he was in his 50s, he had, we proved by genetic testing that he had a defective ApoB, mutation that results in defective ApoB. As a result, there is a diminished interaction of his ApoB bearing particles with the LDL receptor. So he had lifelong elevated LDL. And on top of that, he was doing the carnivore diet and he was had been doing it for about four or five years. So we're talking about a gentleman who had LDL in the four or five hundreds, uh, much of which was lifelong because he had a genetic, he had this variant. And he was absolutely, he was really intense about monitoring for signs of insulin resistance. And 
He was really into the carnivore diet. And so we wanted to, of course, put him on a statin and he didn't want to, he didn't want to take medication. And so we did a coronary artery calcium score and it was zero. So we have this patient who had lifelong LDL, super high and doing carnivore, no signs of insulin resistance and a completely clean coronary artery calcium. So how, I think, how, old, how, how old was he, by the way? Just he was in his 50s. So I think at that age, you might expect to see calcification. He's not too young. Just a, a really interesting case. Yeah, we're seeing quite a few of those. And you're, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the work that maybe Matt Budoff and those guys are doing with yep. lean mass hyperresponders studies. Their, their data collection will end this month, so we'll have you know, the one-year progression or lack of progression uh, results, which would be interesting. I just got off out of a meeting with the Lieutenant Governor of South Dakota trying to get a diabetes versus carnivore study funded and done. And there's another one that's going to happen in Florida. So I don't know how far you are into your fellowship, but probably by the time you're done, we may have a study or two on carnivore versus these various conditions, particularly diabetes, which are so prevalent. So it'll be a little bit more, maybe give you a little more comfort in talking more openly about that because it's hard to make the argument that something is causing disease at the same time curing the disease yeah. it's uh, an interesting type of thing but let me just i know because i'd like to pick your brain on some of these thyroid issues are very common we see that it seems to affect women more so than men i believe particularly hypothyroidism and i think the majority of hypothyroidism is is hashimoto's if i'm not mistaken if i'm not incorrect on that right why what are your thoughts on that and can have you seen obviously there's a relationship between thyroid disorder and, and diabetes we know that's that that relationship's pretty clear we've seen thyroid and cholesterol being a relationship with that as well but a lot of people will complain that if they go to the doctor they'll order a tsh Maybe it's elevated in the light here. Let's put you on a replacement hormone. Is there more to that workup or what do you thought about the appropriate way to figure out what's going on with thyroid? Yeah. So th there is a relation, of course, between thyroid and cholesterol. The thyroid hormone is responsible. It controls LDL receptor expression. And so in severe hypothyroidism, you can have diminished LDL receptor expression and, and hypercholesterolemia. It actually controls also hepatic enzyme that converts cholesterol, th th that promotes bile acid, secretion of cholesterol and bile acid. So you can also develop hypercholesterolemia from that in that mechanism. But I think that the, I think when patients do have an elevated TSH, we also measure the free thyroxine levels in the blood. And if it's, if it's overt hypothyroidism, the TSH is very elevated and the free T4 is low, we, we will start thyroid replacement. And I think that's appropriate. When it's equivocal, the TSH is just borderline elevated. The free T4 is normal. It's a picture of subclinical hypothyroidism. In that setting, we'll usually check the the TPO antibody, which is the marker for Hashimoto's. And if that's positive, then that will definitely predict a risk for progression to overt hypothyroidism and would strengthen the argument to start thyroid replacement. So is there something that patients can do to just reverse the process of this autoimmune destruction of thyroid? Um, we don't really talk about that a ton. You know, I think there are some studies that have shown that actually gluten-free diets can lower some markers of thyroid autoimmunity. But yeah, I've asked this to thyroidologists and there's not like a really clear cut understanding of what the etiology of thyroid autoimmunity is. There's probably some genetic predisposition combined with environmental exposures. But yeah, I think for a lot of patients, we, we do put them on thyroid replacement. And, and I think it's appropriate most of the time. It's a very individualized approach, of course. But yeah, I, I, I don't think that we know that there's really one specific thing nutritionally or that we can do to reverse the thyroid injury. Yeah, I'll just comment that anecdotally, I've seen a number of people with elevated TPOs and other thyroid antibodies that have actually come down by doing carnivore. So it's interesting. So we do see some level, which would indicate to me that environmentally, there's a gut related issue. And this would echo the work of guys like Alessio Fazano at Boston's Children's saying that he believes that hyperpermeability of the gut is contributing to, to autoimmune disease. And as if you have one autoimmune disease, you're more likely to have another autoimmune disease. So we often see people that are type ones with Hashimoto's, with many auto, and things like that. So there, there seems to be a common 
perhaps pathway there that's interesting. And hopefully we'll get some more insight into that in the coming years with hopefully excitement around us doing these things. I guess, so as far as you're obviously in your fellowship there at Stanford and you're, you're, I don't know how many fellows there are, probably what, maybe two or three. I'm just guessing. I don't know how many. Uh, there's fellows. five of us in total. Okay, so pretty big program. So decent yeah. sales program. Do any of the, the, the folks with either faculty or your fellow fellows <laughs> do you discuss diet? They say, hey, what, you're eating all meat. Are you crazy? How does that go? Yeah. So they, uh, yeah, they definitely think I'm a little yeah, out there, but no, we have really fun discussions. Uh, the attendings that I work with are amazing. They're so brilliant. They're so talented. They are understanding. I have great debates with them. We, I think I love picking their brain because they understand metabolism just on another level. And we have fantastic debates all the time. And it's a lot of fun. I think a lot of the times what we end on is that they hear my opinions and they totally hear me out and they see that they're is that there is some potential truth in it that it makes sense but then we always end upon this it wouldn't be ethical to test you know a carnivore diet and nobody's going to approve that kind of study so we ultimately can't really know and that's where we end a lot of the time but no all the time um we have great discussions and they hear me out and agree with a lot of the things that i say and yeah it's fun I'm, I'm just, con- I'm curious about the ethical. It's unethical. I heard it from uh, also at Stanford, Chris Gardner, who's one of the nutrition researchers up there. And in fact, I may go debate him in LA, maybe in, in April, I'm thinking. But I find there are so many people that are doing it anyway. There, are, It's now into the hundreds of thousands. It's really unethical not to test it, in my view, because you got people doing it. And it's like, yeah. if they're already doing it, you might as well find out what the hell's going on with that. And so yeah. it, it'll be interesting to see what is their ethical even as a short-term therapeutic interventional tool. Hey, do it for three months and see what happens. I don't know what the unethical part of that is. I mean, what, what is it? What is the concern? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. I think people would f- really improve their, if they have diabetes, I think the picture would improve dramatically. I think the, what's unethical is that people would be concerned about the rise in LDL. And I understand that because... Patients with metabolic syndrome, they, they do have a very increased cardiovascular risk. But the, in my opinion, a lot of patients who, a lot of p- people who adopt the carnivore diet, the LDL increases, but it's a very, it's not by a, a lot in, in a lot of people. And, and, and I think that should be tolerated, at least for a short-term study. For example, in 2015 was the randomized control trial in the New England Journal about Jardians, which showed that there's a reduction in cardiovascular events in patients who were given Jardians, but those patients actually had a very clear and sustained and dose dependent increase in their LDL. So how could their cardiovascular events go down, but the LDL went up? And so I think that it, clearly we were okay with doing it in that trial. So I'm with you. I think if we could just swallow the pill and get over it, and let people just adopt this carnivore diet for a little bit and look at the outcomes and not just obsess in you know, this LDL centric mindset, but look at the overall cardiometabolic picture. I think that would be really powerful. But again, I don't think that people would approve it. The, I don't think an IRB would approve, would approve. Such well, we'll stuff. see. We're going to get, I think we're going to get some done. I, on SG, SGLT2 inhibitor. And I was going to ask you about that because we've known yeah. that SGLT, just GTL2 inhibitors increase LDL cholesterol. And as you mentioned, improve cardiovascular outcomes. So how do you explain that? Fasting has been shown to increase LDL yeah. cholesterol, and that also tends to have a positive outcome across the board, across many different uh, right. things. So I think that, but I, the other, sometimes people say, what about scurvy? I say, just give them all, give them all a multivitamin. Who cares? Give them all a multivitamin. You can quell that concern. And you've already shown that you're willing to, like you said, in a drug study, you're happy to do, and I don't know how long, a year trial or something like that, that you're willing to tolerate that 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 slight quote unquote risk uh, increase for that but yeah it's interesting what do you find as far as let me ask you a new drug class not they're not new they've been around for about a decade or more 15 years or so the GLP-1s GLP-1 receptor agonists are all the rage everybody's on them they're weight loss drugs or diabetes yeah. drugs some concern around certainly gut motility and paralysis and some other side effects yeah. how is 
what are the, what's the current thought on that? Is, is are they completely safe? Are they safe with supervision? Is are they being dosed wrong? Are they being used inappropriately? What's the thought on that? The general kind of sentiment that I see is extreme excitement about it. And it is a great agent. It's very powerful. Prove the diabetes picture and it can provide weight loss. And people are really excited about it. And if you ask me my opinion, I really, I prescribe them a lot. I really like them because they can really help people, but you have to pick the right person because for me, I don't think, I think the threshold that we should be using it is not, is a little bit higher than where it should be because these agents, they, they do exactly what you said. They have a few mechanisms. They can improve a little bit of insulin secretion, but they really slow the gut motility and they alter the way that our nervous system is perceiving hunger. And so I, I, I think for people who have severe issues with their weight, fantastic. If they're if it's going to provide somebody the ability to eat less, then that's great. But where I have hesitation is the fact that you're right. It can slow gut motility, and I hear from patients all the time that they have they're having symptoms that are completely consistent with gastroparesis. And if you're talking about somebody who has severe hyperglycemia or somebody who has severe issues with their weight, sure. They're going to benefit from eating less and losing weight and that by that improving their metabolic picture. But for somebody who doesn't have such a severe metabolic di disturbance, I, I don't know that we should be using this agents so with such so commonly because I think it's also just the way that I view nutrition. Like I see that patients are eating a lot of processed, low quality foods and the food industry has made food that is so addictive that we now think it's some kind of miracle that we can offer a drug that costs over a thousand dollars a month that just gets you to eat less. I, I think that we should just restore our own satiety mechanism. I think that we should just allow patient, patients to, to lose weight by just not eating such low quality food. You hear these examples that people write about or talk about that the GLP ones just allow them to eat one slice of pizza instead of a pie. But my question is, why are you eating pizza to begin with? If you have disturbed metabolism, if you have issues with carbohydrate intolerance, if you have this picture of metabolic dysfunction, why, why is pizza a regular food for you? You should be eating unprocessed food and so I just see the food industry is attacking patients by just getting them hooked on awful food. And then we're using pharmacology to just induce gastroparesis and slow and slow and reduce the amount of calories they're eating. And it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Again, there's a lot of people who are definitely going to benefit from the GLP ones. But I think overall, if your weight is not that, if you're in the maybe the mild, the overweight category, not obese, if you don't have severe hyperglycemia, perhaps just adopting a more evolutionarily consistent dietary strategy would be more of a powerful long-term strategy. Because if you come off the GLP-1, you're not really protected from those things that you were using it for to begin with. Yeah, some of the concerns, somebody was saying that we, we obviously we have this endogenous and cretin hormone, GLP-1, which is GLP-2, and GIP, I'm sure you're familiar with all those. But it's pulsatile. It's very. It's, it's a short-lived hormone that is just on and off very quickly. And these ag these agonists hang around for a long time. They're, they're, they stay in the stay actively for many hours, and I'm not even sure, maybe even a day or more, or, or longer, a week or more. And that's not appropriate physiology. I liken it to if I go exercise and I go for a run, my heart rate's going to go up. If I could sit on the couch and inject the drug to make my heart rate go up is that the same thing? And I'm not sure it is. And I think that's why you're, I think eating a steak will stimulate, and I know it does, it stimulates GLP-1. We have the mm -hmm. ileal break that occurs when you start getting the nutrition into the distal small intestine, all the L cells are secreting the GLP-1. And so now we're having that when you're eating a, a Snickers bar or a, yeah. a piece of candy. And, and it's, you're hearing people saying that food is sitting in their stomach, not yeah. going anywhere and rotting. And they have this horrible <laughs> reflux and so it's interesting to see, uh, but yeah, it's uh, obviously there's some desperate cases where, yeah, you know, you got to do what you got to do in some cases. That's with bariatric surgery, same thing. Yeah, it's just, who wants their stomach cut out? Not me, but it's <laughs> like there's some people that are so, so bad off they can't they can't do that. Um, 
do you um, see, okay, so let me, what is your plan when you finish your fellowship? Are you going to go into private practice? Are you going to stay academic? Are you going to, are you going to buck the system and be a rebel or what are you going to do? <laughs> I am still working on it because I'm thinking about it now. So most and most fellows in endocrinology, a lot of people do a two-year training where it's purely clinical. And some places like Stanford, the big academic centers offer a three-year pathway where it's actually a research fellowship, which I'm in the research fellowship pathway. So it's a one year of a purely clinical training, which I did already the first year. And now I'm a second year fellow and I'm in the research year now. So I, this year and next year are mostly research. I have one day per week of a general endocrinology clinic and the rest of the time I'm just doing, I'm working in a research lab. So I'm still trying to think about what I want to do long term. I love this world of metabolic diseases and I really need to figure out what I want to do long term. So I'm still working on it, but I'm just really enjoying the experience now. And I, I think in the future, I'll probably re remain in academic medicine and need to figure out if I'm going to be more of in, in the lab. But, but I, I definitely will not give up seeing patients. I, I really love seeing the experiences. I love seeing how excited pa some patients get when they improve. And it's really rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. That's why that's my favorite part is actually talking to people on, on, a, on a daily basis. I still do. I still do lifestyle type consults where it's mm -hmm. not the it doesn't have the, the sort of the problems that, that I could that medicine has in general with some of the stuff. But do you find, I'm just thinking, you got guys telling me it's unethical to do a carnivore diet, but if you stay in academic medicine, maybe you'll be the guy that's in there doing the actual study. That would be interesting. I, I, would, I, would, I would love that. Yeah, maybe if I can convince Chris Gardner to do a, because I, I think a really good study would be a vegan versus carnivore diet for treat this, whatever condition. Yeah. And have both teams on the research panel, that would, that would put it beyond any sort of belief on there's some one particular bias if we both come together on on the protocol i think that would be quite interesting to do that would be really interesting I, i'm not sure how many people i think people are really like into this like the plant-based approach which can have great attributes I mean, if you're taking processed food out of your diet you're going to see big improvements the plant-based approach can really benefit some people I'm not sure how many people really think that like veganism is is beneficial. Even looking at assessments of bone health, there's de decline in bone mineral density and increased fracture risk in in that population. So I yeah, I think that would be I think people would be shocked to see, but I think I would expect that carnivore would really outdo that comparison. It depends on the disease, obviously. If your only biomarker that you count is LDL cholesterol, then of course that would right. be a, that would be the thing they would say. Exactly. I mean, if you looked at just about any other marker, I think you'd see significant improvement there. But it's important that we put we put out that regardless of your strategy, eliminating the, all this hyper processed, ultra processed stuff mm -hmm. in the diet is clearly beneficial. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is it's it, because it's so addictive, and I think I literally think we have people that are just so addicted to this stuff and they can't yeah. get it up it's such a problem for you what do you guys see prater willie ever do you see that is that considered an endocrine yeah. <laughs> i think i've maybe seen a case or two yeah but the truth is that obesity is mostly not these sort of originating in these genetic problems I, th I think that people try to normalize obesity and say that it has such a strong genetic component there may be genetic predisposition genetic susceptibilities that allow people to develop obesity but i think that those susceptibilities are only relevant when you're eating purely processed food if you're eating a, a human diet I, I don't think that those genetic susceptibilities are as relevant yeah i saw the one thing early on a couple of years into this i saw someone with ehlers danlos syndrome which is a genetic connection connected yeah. tissue disorder and they got better they stopped dislocating their joints by changing that which i couldn't understand I'm still that was in your book out. i think it could have been yeah it could have been yeah, yeah that's really that like you wouldn't think that something like that would be reversed improved with you know the diet right. but that's just amazing yeah you're it's interesting because it is a genetic disease there's clear genetic predisposition <laughs> and, and it's clearly been just demonstrated but somehow I guess it will say the genetics, you load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Got a person with Huntington's, Korea, also doing it. That's also one of these horrible, horrible, you know, disease that right. attacks people when they turn 50 or so and they end up dying rapidly. But yeah, it's, it's quite, quite interesting to see. What's as far as your, obviously, when, the, the problem with training is you don't get to follow patients long term because you do whatever and then you rotate out yeah. and do something else. And so it's hard to see long term follow up. But do you see 
Does Stanford have, you mentioned nutritionists, so is that part of the program for everybody or is it only for selected patients or how do you, because I honestly think nutrition affects everything, every condition yeah. out there. And, and is that what's utilized at Stanford or is it only like obesity and diabetes primarily? No, I think that the dietitians are getting referrals from people. Refer, they're getting patients who are not just from from our clinic for obesity or diabetes. I can't really speak actually as to what their referral base is. I, I don't know exactly where they're coming from because I, I pretty much mostly just send them for those uh, reasons. But yeah, I, I think actually kidney disease, I think that there's a couple of things that they specialize in. But I'm sure that they're getting referrals for a lot of different things and they, they do excellent work. And yeah, for me, the most common thing is, is with diabetes is the reason that I send patients there. And do you, you don't have to see, could you say implement low carbohydrate diet as part of that or do you just have to leave it up to them and they just tell them whatever they want to tell them? Oh, can I tell the dietitian to do that? I think that I don't. Uh, usually I'll tell the dietitian like, hey, this patient's on insulin and they'd really benefit from learning how to carbohydrate, how to do carbohydrate counting, or they would just benefit from healthy sort of diabetes nutrition education. But no, I don't do that. And I think I leave it to the dietitian. I, I, I don't, I would not say that the dietitians are, have ruled that out. We had a talk from one of our excellent dietitians recently who, who was talking to the fellows and the endocrine fellows. And she was, I, I think the impression I got was that they, you, you need to really be, you, you need to treat each person, each patient as their own. You need to really provide an individualized approach and gauge what their willingness is to adopt dietary changes. There's some people who are extremely rigid and their dietary habits are so bad. You can't really introduce something so extreme to them because they're just not going to, they're not going to adopt it. But there are patients who are really motivated and who who are already very familiar with low carbohydrate. And I think that the dietitian is not going to tell them not to do that. I think they work with them and tell them how it could be really beneficial. So I think it's just working with each patient, engaging where they're at. But no, I, I'm not really in a place where I would say, you know, we should get this guy on a ketogenic diet or something like that. No. Yeah. Maybe, maybe later on down the road when you're, when you finished out, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you have success with that, I saw a recent, st it was, I think it's a couple, I think it was two years ago, looking at type one diabetics, cancer rates and insulin dosing. And they looked at, they divided into tertiles, low, medium and high. And as you might guess, the people with the highest insulin requirements had greater rates of cancer. Is that anything that anybody ever, is there any like thought about, Hey, how do we not you have taking 200 units a day. Does that ever, is that ever discussed or is it just, just cover your, cover it, cover? No, it? we discuss it. We do. We do. We are trying to minimize the total daily dose as best as we can. We'll do our best to make sure that patients, we do everything we can to get them as sensitive to insulin as possible. Lifestyle approaches, adjunct pharmacotherapies. We do try to reduce the total daily dose as much as possible. And it's fascinating because you're right. I think there is a connection there between cancer and hyperinsulinemia. We know that the AKT, uh, the signaling pathway, the PI3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, which is downstream of insulin receptor and is related to growth signaling. So we, we know that. And in fact, there is pharmacologic agents, chemotherapy that target that pathway. And uh, I actually saw a case, very interesting of a patient who was on one of these one of these medications that is targeting this pathway for cancer and he was actually being treated with with galipizide which increases insulin secretion to control the diabetes so it didn't really make sense to be increasing the patient's insulin levels with galipizide but then be targeting the cancer with that chemotherapy. And so we changed it around and we're really focusing the diabetes management on insulin sensitization rather than excess increasing insulin secretion. So I think we do consider it and we do have many strategies for reducing the total daily dose. I have a fascinating case, really, really awesome. This patient was on insulin injections, super high, 200 units per day. And I started him on an insulin pump and he had type two diabetes. You don't really, it's very, it's pretty uncommon. Yeah, more people are, we're studying more 
using insulin pumps in type 2 diabetes, and it can dramatically increase the total daily dose. He was on 200 units with injections and it got him down to 60 units like within a week. There are many strategies to try and reduce total daily dose. Yeah, interesting there. And it's, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't the, the sulfonylureas are going out of the way? They're not being utilized as much of an old drug that had a lot of... Yeah, we do use them, but very less and in certain situations where we're stuck with it. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, Leo, we're just about out of time here. Are you a social media guy? Do you do any of that stuff? Or I'm not. No? I'm okay. not. I have uh, an email address. I have my cell phone for my family and friends, and that's it. I'm not on any anything really. Got. Well, I, I'm just wondering how you even heard about me or stuff like that, but that's fine. So. Anyway, thank you. Maybe we'll run into each other again. I, I, I really get, hope so. If we get some kind of study at Stanford going, maybe we'll have to hit you up as a, as part of one of the on the research. Please, yeah, I'd love like to that. get involved, and that's so fun to be part of this to really jump in here. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed getting to talk and sh- share some of my experiences. I appreciate it. Keep up the uh, keep get finish up and and keep the open mind going, and hopefully we can change things. So thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, take care. Thank you. It was great to talk.